Okay, since almost everyone is here, hello everyone and welcome to our Horizon Weekly Insider number 40. Today is May, May the 14th and happy Thursday to you all. Please remember that this call is being recorded and is going to be available in our Horizon podcast as well as in our YouTube channel for you to check out later. Please remember to be asking your question while this call is happening so we can have our good Q&A session at the end. So without further ado, I'll pass the word now to Luca for the engineering updates. Thank you, Angie. As usual, there are many topics to be covered under engineering. Today, I'll start with the upcoming release of a new Zendi software. As mentioned already in the past weeks, since the current Zendi software is going to stop working at the beginning of June for our normal upcoming deprecation cycle, we are about to release, as usual, a new Zendi version with a focus on general maintenance. This release is going to be named uh, Zendi 2.0.21. And uh, right now we are in the testing phase. I think Alberto will be talking a little bit more about it, but we plan to publish the new Zendi software on Monday 18th. And uh, together with it, we are publishing also a blog, a blog post with all the info on the specific release contents and instructions on how to upgrade for the different uh, uh, people, for the different stakeholders. So the miners, node operators, wallet users, and so on. We have already sent a first notification to the major partners, including all exchanges and mining pools, giving them one month of notice so that they can prepare well in advance. Last week, we released a new version of Sphere by Horizon. It was version 1.2.6 beta. And from the, the day we released uh, till now, we haven't seen any uh, regression. So it was another successful release. And if you haven't installed it yet, or if you are wondering what is included into it, feel free to check either GitHub or last week's Weekly Insider when we provided the list of contents. Also, please note that there will be another version of Sphere by Ryzen coming soon uh, because we are going to release a new Sphere by Ryzen version that will be compatible with the new Zendi version I was talking about before. And we plan to release that on May 25. In addition to the compatibility with the next Zendi, with the new Zendi, we are also planning to add additional uh, optimizations that are uh, already being worked on and that we, we will announce soon. Uh, a few words also on the new Explorer. We are, going, we are uh, continuing with the parsing of sidechain-related transactions in a main chain block in the new Explorer. And in particular, sidechain certificates inside blocks are now detected and parsed to collect backward transfers. In parallel, we are also adding uh, unit tests and uh, both these activities should end next week, after which we will be able to start the first code review. Uh, okay, this was a panoramic about some different activities that we are bringing on, but the main focus is Horizon's uh, sidechain beta, which includes all the activities related to the sidechain SDK and the main chain changes to support sidechains. We have here Alberto today to tell us a bit more about the latest code review sessions that were performed this week. So Alberto, feel free to continue. Yes, thank you, Luca. Sure. Okay, uh, these uh, last weeks are mainly focused on uh, code reviews and uh, uh, in particular on the SDK and on the main chain side. Okay, uh, regarding the SDK, uh, we finished the, the review of uh, the Latus uh, consensus protocol implementation, I mean, in the forger, on the forger part, and uh, that was approved and merged uh, to the common branch. And so uh, we have uh, then started the review of the integration of uh, Zendu CryptoLib and, and also uh, the part that is responsible for including, generating and including a proof in the certificate. This is almost uh, the last 
part uh, that is uh, necessary to complete the SDK uh, for for beta, because uh, we will have uh, let me say uh, the, the the full functionality in the SDK that is able to uh, accept. Coins, transfer coins, forge with the proper consensus, and collect withdrawal requests, and moreover, generate a certificate and uh, uh, generate a proof for this certificate. And as a last step, submit uh, the certificate to mention. Uh, and so, this this um, part that I've been discussing uh, just now, I mean, uh, are the um, let me say the, the last steps. Uh, for for the SDK. Okay. Uh, regarding main chain. Okay. Currently, we are um, reviewing uh, one of the main pull requests uh, that uh, are. I mean, uh, of the changes of of the main chain. And uh, just uh, to give an idea about uh, the order of magnitude of changes that we. Uh, Applied on the main chain side, we are speaking of more than twenty-five thousand lines of code changed in the in the in the core, and we are not talking about uh, changes in the let me say ancillary part of the code, but in the, in the in the core part. Just to give you an idea of uh, what uh, we have modified, uh, just to start from from the easiest one are transactions. So uh, transaction in main chain. Have been modified. So uh, the structure uh, we introduced new types, new new inputs, new outputs. But uh, and moreover, we also created new kind of transaction. The certificate is a totally new kind of transaction. So um, this is um, something that has been added to the to the to the uh, original code base. But obviously, we had to also to modify the block. The block itself, the main chain block, is different. The main chain block has. Uh, contains different things, contains certificates, for example. So we have to restructure the block to uh, being able to accept this. But moreover, uh, we have been also ha had to modify the way for also, I mean, uh, exchanging also certificates for, um, let me say, between, between nodes to be included in the mempool. So also this was part of this change. But... Uh, Moreover, we had to change the, the how the mempool is pro is processed because the mempool itself uh, will need to handle in a different way, for example, dependencies of transactions because you can have a transaction that uh, use uh, send some coins to a sidechain, but let's suppose that in the same mempool you have a transaction that create a sidechain, so you have this sort of also dependencies that should be. Uh, kept in consideration when uh, accepting something into the mempool. But this is just an example. I mean, there are many other things that have uh, uh, should have been uh, that have been taken into account for uh, uh, let me say modifying the code for the mempool. But uh, another important, really important part that we uh, have touched is the coins database. So. Our blockchain has more than the other blockchain has a, a coins database that is reflects the coins that are currently available, the UTXOs that are currently available in the in in the blockchain at at a certain block. Uh, we had to modify how these coins are indexed, what is in there, because just for making an example, um, the maturity of backward transfer follow different rules from maturity of the change in the certificate. So uh, this means that the, the 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 coin structure itself should keep track of should 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 allow us to keep track of this. And moreover, um, this should also. Uh, uh, moreover, we should also take in consideration. Uh, uh, retro compatibility, so we had to modify the coins database in a way that manage this man manages um, and also uh, uh, let me say all the implication for block reverts. So what happens in case a, a, a block is reverted uh, containing a certificate? How the coins are restored or 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 or, uh, or cancelled? I mean, and all this stuff. And this includes also keeping track of the sidechain balance and 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 all these things. But um, just another uh, small example of what is in, is included in 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 this 
in, in this release is um, <laughs> we introduced a, a new hash function in the main chain. So we are using a totally new hash function for a new Merkle tree that we added in the block. So in the block, there is a new Merkle tree that is useful for fast synchronization of sidechain. Let me summarize in this way. And this is a, a totally new Merkle tree that is calculated for a block and uh, is something that is stored in the block. I mean, the Merkle root of it. And is using a, a Poseidon hash that was not um, not present in our main chain core. So we had to use, yeah, we had to integrate another implementation that we made. So we had the Rust implementation of it and we included it in, in, in the sidechain, in the main chain core. And last, uh, I mean, probably for sure I'm, I'm, I'm missing many other parts, but the biggest, one of the biggest, uh, we, are, we have also introduced and, inter and interfaced a new Groth 16 proof verifier that is able, uh, that we are using for validating certificates. So our main chain core now uses uh, a new uh, proof verifier. So we introduced this new proof verifier that is, uh, let me say, is based on the Zex implementation, but we also have uh, also extended and, and, uh, um, and let me say, improved. Um, and so currently our main chain core has another proof verifier interfaced that is able to verify, uh, how to say, uh, mm, proofs um, with specific with with general verification keys. So, and this will allow us to verify certificate proofs using the verification key that is associated with that specific uh, uh, sidechain declared in the sidechain creation transaction. So. Uh, <laughs> I mean, a, a, as you can see, uh, there are tons of changes. So currently, um, we are in the final part of uh, of reviewing these changes, and so I mean, there is a lot of work uh, in um, you know to verify that everything is um, designed properly, and there are no issues uh, and vulnerabilities. Uh, I mean, there are so many elements that we so many things that we added so that uh, obviously this requires uh, time to to be reviewed but we are proceeding quite well and uh, for now uh, some minor changes were requested so for now uh, we are we are proceeding quite well uh, but obviously i will uh, provide more details uh, in, in the next days Okay. I was going I was going to try to make a clever joke about how simple that all sounds but I wasn't even clever enough to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> sounds amazing Alberto. Thank you for going into the the details there. Oh, no problem. Thank you Rob. Okay, and just the last thing <laughs> is uh, uh because in the meanwhile we are also uh have our deprecation so we have also the release and um okay um most of the elements of this uh, uh, Zendi release uh, have uh, already been uh, reviewed and approved. So we're almost ready there. And also uh, we proceeded with some tests uh, in, uh, with Chronic. Everything so far seems, seems fine, but I mean, the testing phase uh, uh, is, is uh, still going on. Uh, I think uh, it's almost everything, I would say. And please, Luca. Thank you, Alberto, for uh, all the great updates. So back to Angie for now and see you later for the Q&A session. Awesome updates. Thank you. Let's continue with Spencer for the help desk updates. Happy Thursday, everyone. I posted the data from the help desk on the companion channel. This is going to be a short report today. 68.2% of the tickets were faucet-based, 318 Tickets were other issues. Most prominent faucet issues were uh, VPN use. Uh, we did not allow VPN use on the faucet. 31.8% uh, of the tickets were for other issues which were scattered about. Uh, the most prominent um, sphere issue was that um, speed recovery. Typically, a user uh, forgot their 24 word backup phrase or were certain that by providing an address to the help desk that we would be able to remotely reinstate your Sphere account. Um, obviously, 
not reading or understanding the explicit uh, understanding that it's a local account. Um, customer satisfaction over the past seven days, 4.5 average out of a scale of five, over 37 user reviews, and that concludes the report from the help desk. Thank you, Spencer. Let's continue with Gustavo for the UX updates. Hey everyone, happy third Thursday. So I have a small update, small update, but big in terms of work. So we continue working towards the community hub and we continue supporting and the development on the HD. And that's all. Thank you, Gustavo. Now let's welcome Rowan for the BD updates. Thank you, Angie. Um, okay, so just off the phone with our friends over at Flipside Crypto. Phone. I'm not sure if a phone is the right term for this. I kind of sound like I'm about 20 years in the past, uh, just off a conference call with Flipside Crypto. And they've confirmed that they have a go live date for a new feature they're going to be adding for Horizon. So you know that they've been uh, measuring different kind of facets of the Horizon ecosystem for some time. They split up their, their FCAS score into developer activity and user activity and market maturity. But they also have a kind of chain walker that gives a little bit more detailed insight into what's actually happening uh, on the transparent chain, kind of the flow of Zen and where it goes. And it's a, a service they're calling the Flipside Cooperative. It's completely open, completely transparent, currently supports five different chains, and they'll be adding uh, Zen to that uh, system on Monday. So it'll be going live then. So I kind of a little bit of an advanced announcement, but they're happy for us to do so. So this will really show how Zen is dispersed uh, and really how exchanges and miners and different kind of uh, people within the ecosystem are, are operating. So pretty cool. I'll post a link here in the chat so people can check out the other projects that are supported already, get a little bit of an understanding about what this really is beyond just my kind of very simplistic explanation. Um, beyond that, there's two kind of main projects ongoing with the BD team. The first one is an exchange outreach project to try and get more exchanges supporting uh, or providing access, is probably the best way to put it, to Horizon Nodes. And the second one is a project to really try and expand our network of software development companies, infrastructure providers, uh, and and people like that in the run-up to our, our sidechain beta launch. Uh, so that's a very large piece of work um, and something that we're getting our teeth into uh, a lot more as we get closer and closer to the code being out in the wild. Uh, so if you are a development company or an infrastructure provider or even just an interested party, please feel free to reach out to us. We would love to explain uh, what we're building in a bit more detail and pull you into the fold. And that's pretty much it for me at the moment. I'll pass back to anybody else in BD if they want to jump in with an update. Okay, let's continue now with Lucy for the marketing updates. Hello, everyone. Um, actually, I do have some BD updates uh, from our China market. So um, community manager Guan uh, will be attending two events, one in the end of this month, and then the second one is the beginning of June. So just really glad to see that the um, public uh, um, activities are picking up really quickly uh, in China, in our China market. So on the communication side, uh, we will be publishing a general uh, security guidelines to help our community uh, keep their Zane and data safe from scammers. Those scammers often impersonate uh, Horizon team members or our support team or um, Horizon bots. Uh, so they may ask you to install software, install wallets, or you know even asking for your pi uh, private key. So we would never do that. Um, and then uh, um, you know, along with a lot of other little details, we will um, put them on the general guideline. And uh, uh, so our community will uh, will not be will not be scammed. So uh, we also have uh, a uh, an AMA with the uh, Kubit. So we are doing AMA with our third party wallet. Uh, sorry, third third wallet partner, um, Kubit X. They are 
the one that makes the very cool cool wallet. So we are collecting questions on our social media until May eighteenth, uh, which is next Monday. So you can ask us anything you want、uh, to know about us or our partner、uh, Kubex, and both teams will answer your questions in a blog. And the Horizon branded Bluetooth w-、uh, cool wallet is available for purchase on our store. So speaking of store, we have just added some new arrivals with new designs.、Uh, so they're really cool.、Uh, so please check out. And then we had a naming competition for our mascot last week, and our community voted on top ten name options. We released the winner on Monday,、uh, and then the winning name for our mascot is Zenny. So I want to thank our community for the perfect name,、uh, and we have a line of Zenny swag on our store, and then we have just added a new blueprint、uh, design to the Zenny collection as well. So. I'm ordering some for myself because the design is really awesome, and I want to thank our designer,、uh, very awesome designer、uh, Linda, for the cool designs. So、um, you can check it out on our store,、uh, store dot horizon dot global. And then the hashtag How to Stay Zen campaign ended.、Uh, Ended this week, we received thousands of uh, uh, responses from our community and、uh, telling us how they stay zen during the lockdown during this uh, 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 pandemic. And then we received a ton of very fun,、uh, encouraging、um, responses. So, and then we also chose ten、uh, winners. So, congratulations for、uh, people who won, and then、uh, of everyone who participated. And the keep stay zen. And then we are doing、uh, we are doing updates to our website、um, and an overall、uh, kind of improvement. I and mean, we do that、um, uh, always do that, but we are now focusing more on our messaging and an over overall、um, yeah, messaging、uh, communications to our community. So、uh, and then along with that, we are also、uh, working on、uh, some other website.、Uh, The, uh, uh, projects,、uh, including、um, our very uh, popular、um, Faucet 2.0, and then also the online news room, and that's it from me. Thank you. Pass it to you, Jonathan. Hey everyone, happy Thursday.、Uh, two things today. So the first one, Rowan, you reminded me about Fcast. So really. Cool news there. So、um, after we implemented the sweet huddle bonus. We saw an enormous, enormous jump in ratings for user activity. So our user activity rating right now on FCAS is eight seventy one, which is in the top fifteen projects in the entire industry.、Um, that user activity score <clears throat> is considered an A. It's broken out into two sections: network activity and project utilization. So、um, network activity is an A, but here's a really interesting part: our project utilization, a subcomponent of user activity, is a nine twenty four, which is an S, S rating on FCAS. So I don't know, have we ever had an S in anything on FCAS before? I, I'm not sure, but this is really exciting news, and it, it really shows that all of these small changes that. We make on the faucet,、uh, which is really just the start as we transition into faucet 2.0, are making huge impact, and people like FCAS are are picking up on it,、um, and you know having an S is super exciting. So,、uh, in addition to the FCAS,、uh, we also have、uh, a call out to all game developers in our community.、Um, if you ha- have a game that you've developed and you want to integrate Zen into your game. Or if you're developing a game and would like to integrate Zen,、uh, please reach out to us on Twitter. I would、uh, really like to chat with you and talk about how we can make that happen.、And、that's it for me. Thanks. Thank you, Jonathan and Lucy. Ralph, would you like to add any comments or updates? Yeah, I sure would.、Um, so I want to leverage off what Jonathan just said about.、Uh, The excitement with the sweet huddle bonus and the、uh, the faucet,、uh, and what what Alberto said. So when whenever Alberto gives an update, I find it extremely exciting. 
um, because we're doing a number of things with the main chain, with the implementation of the side chain front and backward transfer that really are new and different in the industry. But big picture, we don't want changes to the main chain to be exciting. We want changes to the main chain to be straightforward, steady, uh, no problems, you know, continuous improvement. When we roll in the, uh, the side chain implementation, that's going to be great. It's going to be integrated with all our partners. And perhaps a year from now, our main chain will be really boring. It'll be more like Bitcoin, which, you know, everybody knows it's just going to continue on the, the way it is and not have any main many changes. But where all the excitement can come in is on the side chain, because this is where a lot of new and different things can be. And uh, the side chain can be a complicated idea or it can be a pretty straightforward idea. So basically, you're able to build your own application and blockchain uh, with the uh, software de development kit that's, that, that we're shipping here soon. You'll be able to build a Cardano type side uh, chain using Java, which because it's, it's based on Ouroboros, which is like Cardano, should be able to do smart contracts like they do uh, the Plutus smart contracts. So by being able to build an app and a blockchain and not have to worry about all the different things of getting the token on an exchange or getting support or things like that, because Horizon already has that part already figured out, that's where a lot of the excitement's going to be. So we're going to be able to do things uh, we're, we're going to be doing side chains that have been part of our original vision. So voting side chain, governance side chain, node tracking and payment side chain, other things that help the Horizon system to run. But we can do other things. And like Jonathan was saying, how people are excited about the faucet. Well, th this is with a, with, a, with a faucet that we run. And I, I don't want to denigrate this in any way, but it is somewhat of a centralized faucet. We would be able to build a faucet sidechain application, which everybody can see is provably fair in its distribution. And they can say, you know, so instead of saying, man, I, I, I logged on every day this week. How come I'm not getting the bonus? Well, it can, it can go through and see the bonuses were paid out. Um, and, and so that's by running things on a sidechain blockchain, it's a provably fair type of system. The next thing that we can do is look at what other types of sidechain applications we might want to do. So an idea that came up a number of months ago that we're close to being able to uh, start the design and implementation of is a lottery. There's no reason why we can't do a very small weekly lottery, you know, Wednesday to Wednesday or something like that, where people could, uh, just like buying a lottery ticket, you know, uh, do that on the, on the lottery sidechain app. Uh, and then um, possibly win or not win the next week. The difference, again, is that by being on a blockchain, it's a, it's a system that people can say, look, this much was paid into the lottery and this much was paid out. It's exactly by, by the rules. And it's something that's new and different and it's something that people would use their Zen for. Because for the most vast majority of people, we want to do things with our Zen. We don't want to just you know, say, well, you know, I'm going to buy some Zen and then I'm not going to think about it anymore. We want people to use it all the time. And that's just the first step of any type of game or things like that. So there's a lot of different options and there's a lot of different paths where that development can take. Certainly, you know, our well-established uh, uh, professional software development design architecture and cryptography team is going to pursue the uh, side chains that are building out the Horizon Network, but there's no reason that community developers or uh, other types of people um, can't be doing all these different side chain applications that are fun, that are games, that are different things to do that engage people. So anyway, that's what I wanted to say. And awesome. Rod, yeah, perfect examples, I think. Very, uh, yeah. Um, I think that, for example, the lottery is a, is a great example that explains uh, how can be used and how we can create uh, easily auditable applications that, for example, in this case, redistribute funds. So, yeah, uh, that's perfect. Thanks, Rob. You bet. Awesome. Now let's welcome Rob for the final part in the Q&A session. Cool. Thanks, Angie.
Uh, all right, guys, I have two two pretty big topics to talk about, so I'll try to run through quick. We're, we're already going a bit over time, so we're going to go a, a bit more over time. But the first thing is um, the idea of an overarching KPI or key performance indicator for the organization. And I've been talking about KPIs for some time now uh, and talking about building up KPIs from, from the divisions on up. But what, what I've thought of recently is we need an overarching KPI. And what I think matters most for us that it shows that you know, a success or not of the project is how much are people willing to pay to use the network? So basically summing up transaction fees across the network. This is the purest indicator of if what we're doing is working and we're actually providing value to the marketplace, people will actually come and use the network and, and pay fees to use it. So a quick anecdote or a quick fact uh, before I move on with you know what this is going to mean for us is right now, I would say the most successful blockchain project in existence is Ethereum because Ethereum has... Uh, about $75 million worth of transaction fees paid to the network every quarter. Um, ours, so far, is is much less, and for most projects, they're non-existent. So for us, I'll, I'll just give you guys the number because um, you know, it, it shows where we are today. We have to embrace that, and we need to think more importantly, what are we going to do about it? So every quarter, currently, we're earning about, or our network is earning about $1,000 per quarter in transaction fees if you add them all up. So puny compared to an Ethereum, but still one could argue that um, currently, you know, until we have the sidechain implementation, we, we are a cryptocurrency and we're a cryptocurrency competing in a market of a thousand or more other cryptocurrencies and in a world where, you know, the dominant few cryptocurrencies are those to capture most of the market share. So what this does for us is it gives us a baseline that we can now start making decisions against. So uh, there are two two real components for, you know, as as people are evaluating our project or as we evaluate our project, you have a contem- contemporaneous uh, measure here. So how much revenue is our network earning today? And we can measure that. And we know that it's not very much, but it's it's more than probably 90, 90% or more of the projects out there. Uh, but it's not enough. Um, and more importantly, as people are, ev- are evaluating projects in the market, they're, they're thinking, how much can this project earn in the future? So what, what kind of projections could they make on you know, products that we're building, um, you know, tools that we're providing to the marketplace that people might want to use to actually build useful services on top of Horizon? Uh, and this is what we're focusing on. So we, we're doing a, first a deep dive on what people are currently using or paying for in the blockchain ecosystems. So if we look across projects, from Bitcoin to Ethereum to any others that are, say, in the top 10 in terms of earning transaction revenues. Uh, what are they doing? What are people actually spending money on? And, and let's align what we're doing today, because if anyone's using a UTXO-based Bitcoin-like blockchain today, they could be using Horizon, right? So that's not us saying we have some big technological advantage on what you could do today with it, but we have a fantastic organization and we, ha- we can provide other value to induce people to start using Horizon similarly. The second thing, the really big thing is, and you had a flavor for this when Alberto was going into detail about what's being included in beta, uh, we are hyper-focused on delivering enormous future value. And by future value, I don't mean far off in the future. I mean with beta. So beta is opening up a completely new world for us, going from um, our value proposition being a UTXO-based cryptocurrency blockchain um, to one where we have an unbounded uh, platform or, or a platform with unbounded application uh, you know, opportunities. So there's an enormous amount of work going into beta. What I can say, just two things on it is one, we've we've scoped it down to precisely what's needed to make a functioning system. So the beta release will be an actual functioning sidechain system and and no more. So we're, we're not gold plating this. We're not adding on a whole bunch of extra functionality right now. We fully understand that we need to deliver to the marketplace a minimum viable product, uh, but it's a very sophisticated product. And you know, just based on what you heard from Alberto, it, it is not it is not a simple thing. We're talking about in aggregate something like uh, over a hundred thousand lines of code being delivered uh, between the different components here. Resources internally are being shifted um, to the critical areas to get this to market. So we're very sensitive to the idea of. We have to deliver this technology to market, and it's got to be pretty quickly, right? We've been working on this from scratch for some time now, um, but again, this is not a a very simple thing. So we really have two components of value now. We've got the the near-term stuff, 
And we're going to be pushing hard on getting people to do things in the very near future with our blockchain that they could do right now. But the really big stuff is, is going to be delivered with with beta in our sidechain system. And Rolf went into a fantastic detail, or at least a taxonomy overview of, of the types of things that could go on with, with sidechains. So that's it. Now, now that we have our, our overarching KPI, now every decision that we, we take uh, should directly or indirectly impact that KPI. So we should in, we should be thinking about how are the things we're doing impacting what people are actually willing to pay to use our network. So when we think about engineering or product, we think how is this how is this technology going to to expand the set of real world use cases for the system? Well, that's embodied it, it perfectly with the sidechain system. That's all about expanding the set of things that people can do with our system. Uh, when we do infrastructure and, and we think about prioritize, prioritizing infrastructure, we think, how is what we're prioritizing supporting, you know, the highest marginal contribution to generating network activity? Uh, and I'm not talking about bogus network activity. I'm talking about things that third parties or, you know, people, independent parties are willing to actually pay for, like broadcasting a transaction, uh, posting data to the blockchain with, within some application. These are things that add, add value or and we can, you know, uh, look at uh, as proxies to are we doing a good job? When we think about BD, are our efforts aligned with partnerships and integrations that have high impacts on network network income? When we think of growth, are we pulling in users who are actually going to generate network income or not? Right, and we we have to think about this across lifetime engagement within Horizon. So a simple example here would be uh, our faucet users um, who register their Zen addresses. If we track these addresses over time. Are these people actually doing things with their Zen, right? Or are they just kind of grabbing the Zen and, and dumping it? Well, so far, all indicators are pointing towards beneficial interactions with these these users. When we think of marketing, are we building a brand and communicating what we're doing to the right people who are actually going to pay to use the network? Right? These are just all ways that we can think about using KPIs um, in a productive way. So I also think that KPIs can be way overrated. It's the ultimate buzz term in, in the venture and startup world. Why? Well, because KPIs could be completely misused. You could choose the wrong KPIs and your entire organization could be going in the wrong direction. Here, I think we're being very specific about something that is so obviously a beneficial KPI. The other thing is you could like KPIs manage the organization instead of the other way around where the organization should manage the KPIs. So what you don't want to do is provide the wrong incentives to compromise long-term growth, chasing short-term performance indicators. But again, I think here we've chosen some very good KPIs or probably the perfect KPI to really aggregate everything that we're doing. And ultimately, at the end of the day, you know, for for the pros and cons, we have to know that what we're doing actually makes sense and we're moving in in a positive direction. Uh, So you need KPIs. And I'm really happy with this one. So we're going to use this as a tool that we're going to measure every quarter. Every division is going to map what they're doing into direct or indirect contributions and it's going to provide us visibility into how we're actually performing. And is our network growing in usefulness or not? Um, so we've been around for a few years now. And I think we've built, uh, or, or for sure, we've built an absolutely amazing team. Our technology path is extremely exciting, innovative, and, and it's designed to solve some of the biggest problems in blockchain. But we have to know at a granular level that, you know, on, on the margin, are we pushing in the right direction? Uh, I am absolutely convinced we are. So the second thing I wanted to talk about, and again, I know we're running over time. But uh, going to the the direction that we're in, this was a a little bit of an ex-post analysis of our strategy thus far. And I've I've decomposed this into two options. So strategically speaking, we had a hard road or an easy road that we could have chosen. And and this was, say, two years ago, we made a a decision to go down the hard road. So I'll, I'll tell you first what the easy path would have been. So the easy path for us would have been choosing something like the 10 most interesting projects and just mimicking everything they did, everything that's interesting that they do. So watch Bitcoin, watch Litecoin, watch Dash, watch Zcash, watch any other project that is is related to us, and just take what they're doing and integrate it, test it, and publish it. This would have led down a path of rapid, continuous stream of deliveries, high developer activity for anyone paying attention, and that, that activity probably would have drawn in other developers, right? If you have high developer activity, then developers are attracted to that. We could have probably also boosted the prices then by doing this, by people looking at this continuous stream of activity, they probably would have had a beneficial impact to our price. And we could have, you know, reinvested some of these gains into further R&D, right? That would have been the easy path. And I'm not, I'm not saying right or wrong at this point, I'm just identifying what the paths are. 
the harder road, the road that we we ultimately chose to go down was develop our own innovation to some of the biggest problems in blockchain. And the two problems that we were tackling were scalability and application privacy. Both are really big deals because I'm not convinced that that, uh, the blockchains that existed before us were really that scalable, in particular for real economic functions going at scale to, to blockchain. And, and I think that application uh, privacy is is a really big deal in a world where we're continuously losing our privacy, right? And, and the industry is focused, I think, quite well on, um, you know, value privacy or privacy for coins and privacy for, you know, transferring value between different parties. But a huge elephant in the room that hasn't been tackled very well was on the data privacy side. And this is an enormous element of, you know, personal personal liberty, freedom, of actually you know, providing the tools for people to to not just you know take an ideological stance on privacy, but to actually provide a useful, productive mechanism for people to make money on delivering privacy to a marketplace, and that's what's, what's ultimately sustainable. So, w- what did the hard path you know, include here for us was well, we we chose by working on interesting problems that helped us hire an absolutely fantastic team. So, uh, and, and this goes beyond just the engineers that we attract. We we have I. I, I think will become very evident very quick, very soon when we deliver beta, one of the best engineering teams in the industry, but not just one of the best engineering teams in the industry. We've also attracted absolutely phenomenal human beings across all of our divisions from marketing, BD, infrastructure, growth, you name it, uh, and, uh, an incredible team and incredible people are drawn to very innovate or drawn to innovation, period. Um, so if we had chosen the, the easier path, right, we would have drawn potentially a different type of people into the project. Again, not saying good or bad, they all have value. We've certainly suffered, I think, in the marketplace because of it, because the reality is we've chosen to make a long-term investment on long-term success. Now, the good news is we're approaching that long-term right now, right? Or in the very near future, we are delivering the culmination of a two-year investment in significant innovation, and in significant innovation that solves real problems in the marketplace. Uh, now the hard road doesn't. Uh, I'm I'm not saying here we're we're delivering a gold plated product to market. What we're doing is we're delivering a minimum viable product, but it's a working product, right? So we're very sensitive to the idea of we know that we have to deliver to the market. We can't just keep you know saying we're going to deliver the best possible thing. And we're going to keep delaying that. We're not. We're we're working on exactly what needs to be done to have a functional product, and we'll be maturing that once it's published, right? So we're going to publish, and we're, then we're going to have. Uh, a continuous stream of improvements to it. So we're doing exactly that. We're also shuffling resources to make sure that we're, we have optimal, you know, uh, whenever we have slack in one area, if we have success in one area or one area is ahead of schedule, we, we shuffle that over to make sure that we're catching up in other areas. All right. And what we're delivering is massive. So Alberto gave you a little bit of a sense there, but we're talking about an order of magnitude of about 100,000 lines of new code, a code base built from scratch. And this is very rare in the industry. So, um, our technology strategy and the reason why I, I think ex post analysis, I, I, I still believe we're on the right path, uh, is because it opens up a huge, uh, it, it transitions us from being a cryptocurrency to a platform with an unbounded set of real applications that can be built on it that go beyond coin transfer or simple data public publishing to a blockchain network as it exists today. Massive scalability and applications with the architecture that was chosen with the Zendu implementation. And the promise of smart contracts on a, a core proof of work UTXO based system. This bridges what I think is currently uh, in high demand right now is bridging that public to private blockchain uh, gap that exists where there are a lot of businesses choosing to build on private blockchains, which I don't think makes sense. The implementation that we're delivering to the marketplace is, is extremely innovative and it, it covers that gap. It gives businesses a reason to build on a public network that I think didn't quite exist before. But I would say importantly here, and this is the big insight from say an economics perspective is by modularizing the system architecture, what we do for future innovation is we, is we open up a much larger set of future innovations because you don't have to convince this core team of anything to innovate on our, on our future sidechain system. You can innovate on your own sidechain and, and not seek permission from anyone not convince us to do any modifications to the main chain and not have to go through a more complex governance process uh, to do that innovation. So the scope of things that we can do with this architecture is absolutely enormous compared to, you know, the option of had we gone down the easy path. So 
you know, in summary, we're, we're at the last mile of this marathon here and we're not going to change course. This was just to say, you know, to, to really outline the two largely different paths we could have been on. Maybe there was some hybrid strategy that could have been involved there, but I, I'm extremely excited with the path we've gone down and we're nearing the, the end here of a very large investment that is going to really blow open the doors for innovation and possibility for real world usage. In, in particular, how it maps back to our, our overarching KPI. So I'll stop here, guys, and we can open it up to any questions. I know we're already over. Hey, um, Rob, yeah, I know that we've uh, gone over a little, but I think it's totally fine uh, because I think people have uh, uh, get started, started getting really excited about uh, uh, about everything that we are doing because as we we got some really good questions about sidechains today so the first one is uh, will there be any sidechain that will serve as a benchmark to make sure nodes will be capable would it be possible to see large amount of nodes drop off because they couldn't meet the requirements well alberto i i love punting questions to you but i think this is a fantastic question because it shows we have to be thinking about the the infrastructure requirements for actually running this type of system Okay, well, let me, let me jump in there. Oh, sorry, please, please, Rob, please. Sorry about that. Uh, I guess Rob did hand it to you, but I wanted to jump in there and say this has been part of our actual strategy all along, where we create a centralized version of a system that we know we're going to transition to decentralized in the future. So we've built, you know, it is a centralized node tracking and payment system that does track that the, the nodes are. Um, meeting their their requirements and doing the payment. We've learned so much through doing that. And by creating all the application logic and everything else in a centralized system, we're then able to bring it over to a decentralized system. And I'll step out and let uh, Alberto address the specifics of that. Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, okay, let Maybe we can see in in in, in two different uh, areas. So, uh, first, um, for sure, uh, we can um, decentralize the system for uh, verifying. Let me say the the requirements that the requirements of the nodes are met, and and this will be done on side chain, and and so it will be publicly auditable if a node. Uh, follow the requirement. Another topic is: uh, Is a node capable of running a specific session? Okay, let me say first: every uh, every node could can run uh, a, a session node. Um, they are using for for a session uh, our SDK. The node will be so lightweight because uh, we are using Ouroboros as as a as a consensus, so it will be a proof of stake. So it will be so lightweight. So, I mean, uh, we can have even nodes uh, running uh, a sidechain, a specific sidechain that are even not part of, for example, a secure node set. So uh, the requirement, I mean. A, Every person can run this node and be rewarded uh, by the fees that are generated in the in the in the sidechain. So you will be able to install a sidechain node, uh, forge a block, obviously, uh, and your probability will be uh, proportional to the stake that you have in the specific sidechain. I mean, following the robber's rules. And you will be rewarded with the fees. So um, this doesn't uh, imply that. Uh, I mean, this doesn't imply that all the nodes should run all the sidechains. This is uh, this should be uh, a very free market where everyone can choose if running a specific sidechain. And let me say, this is going to um, promote. And 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 uh, yeah, promote the the, the real uh, value sidechain. So, for example, if we have a sidechain that uh, has a lot of interest and a lot of transaction, this means a lot of fees, and so we will, and also a lot of stake in there, and so we will have a lot of uh, forgers. I mean, nodes that want to to join this sidechain because they will have a, a lot of reward from that. 
So um, I hope that this uh, uh, explain a little bit uh, how why this is, should not be an issue. Thank you, Alberto. So the second question is, is there a minimum of coins needed to start a sidechain? And will these coins be burnt or transferred to the main chain by the dApps on it? Please, Alberto, if you want to fill this uh, one. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, so uh, regarding this, <laughs> okay, this is a controversial. <laughs> okay, uh, fair. And it's related also to another question. Uh, the spam of sidechains. So maybe I can uh, answer both together. Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, the first thing probably we uh, should think about is what is the cost of a sidechain? So uh, you have a problem of spam if the sidechain has a cost for the network, okay? And if this cost for the network is not, let me say, covered somehow by the cost of starting it. So, uh, let me say, extreme case. Let's say that declaring a sidechain costs as creating a, uh, a coin output. So, making a transaction that uh, create, create a UTXO. As you can see, if the cost is comparable, you have not this kind of problem because, I mean, the fees that you are going to pay for the transaction are preventing, let me say, the spam. And the cost of having uh, the UTXO, and in this case, the, the, the sidechain, is comparable to, um, let me say, is, is not something that will harm the network. So, uh, what we had in mind in the when we designed how to manage each sidechain processing is to make the management of this sidechain processing very uh, let me say lightweight for the node in a way that doesn't have uh, uh, how to say a cost that um, let me say will will can be used by an attacker to the, the network by creating a lot of the sidechain and uh, having the network, let me say, not being able to, to manage them. So, <laughs> for this reason, we uh, are, let me say, uh, not uh, burning coins for the creation of the sidechain. Also, considering that uh, when you if we want to put a, if we uh, want to put a requirement in terms of, in terms of coins to, to be burned, or a minimum uh, to be um, used for creating a sidechain, as you can see, uh, this becomes a big problem if you consider that the, the, the price is, is you know, fluctuating, no? So maybe today one zen is a good amount, maybe to, in, in, in one month one zen is, 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 is an, an enormous amount. I so, like that forecast, but that is not investment advice, yeah. Alberto. <laughs> Just joking. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, uh, for this reason, uh, we have to, um, let me say, use the, 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 the fee market as a way for managing this, uh, uh, this uh, barrier, entry barrier. Uh, and so, for, for this reason, uh, we are uh, requi we require that for uh, creating a, a, a sidechain, you have to pay the fees for sure. And this will, uh, let me say, the number of fees is is going to be, let me say, um, something related to the to the size of the transaction. I mean, following the rules that are uh, needed for um, determining the value that should be paid by 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 the creator. But the impact of managing the, the sidechain will be, uh, let me say, almost um, will, will come almost for free from a, from a, a main chain perspective. And for example, when, uh, when the sidechain will cost, when it will receive a certificate, but the certificate will have to pay fees to be accepted. 
and the fee, the number of fees uh, are going to be, uh, let me say, um, decided uh, somehow uh, by the miner itself. So the number of fees should be uh, let me say, respecting uh, a, a, a fair market uh, uh, value. And so, uh, as we can see, uh, there should not be this kind of issue because all the 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 the, the, um, the steps that are costly in terms of management of the sidechain are going to be managed uh, by uh, a specific transaction that will have to pay fees. Uh, I I hope that I, I answer the question. It was clear. Yeah, Alberto, that was great. Thank you. Um, so last question, how will spam sidechains be dealt with? What prevents or discourages creation of many useless or malicious sidechains? Okay, partially, uh, I mean, was covered uh, previously, but maybe I was not focusing on the, on the okay, useless, I mean, uh, it's, uh, okay, first, it's not an issue if it doesn't have the cost, the sidechain, in terms of cost for the main chain, okay? And, uh, and we discussed it before. Okay, for the malicious sidechain, uh, I mean, uh, it, this is a decentralized uh, word. So uh, we cannot say, we, we don't have uh, an entity that says this is good or this is bad. So um, it would be possible, obviously, malicious sidechain. So for this, it will be uh, needed that... Um, Anyone that wants to use a sidechain will will have the possibility to see uh, if it is a a, a real uh, a real project and uh, with the, with the code published and uh, uh, made by trustable people and so on or uh, uh, you know developers trusted developers as you would do for any other kind of project on. on on the internet and in the blockchain space, so uh, I think that the the approach that should be used should be the same that you are going to use for for any other kind of application that is on is on, is on the internet now. And, and I'll say just an important point here is uh, it, there's no such thing as a side chain without nodes actually running it. So it, it's not like we could have spam to the extent where you know someone could just generate a million side chains out of nowhere. Uh, they also need nodes to actually run them. So, you know, this is kind of one big integrated marketplace where incentives, you know, and constraints should align to hopefully have, have a you know, relatively healthy ecosystem. Okay, thank you. Uh, these are the top three questions for today's Weekly Insider. So we will post uh, um, a couple other questions on the list and then answer them on the Weekly Insider chat channel here on Discord. And if you are listening on this uh, on YouTube, you can uh, uh, ask your questions in the comment section. Thank you and stay safe. Back to you, Angie. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, for this great Weekly Insider. See you soon. Bye-bye.